I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. And I'm here to read the funnies to your happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time. And here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. And I know a riddle. Oh, quick, ask it of me. Why is a horse like a lollipop? Well, I don't know how a horse could be like a lollipop. They don't look alike. No. A lollipop can't walk. No. You can't eat a horse. No. Well, you could, but it's not a very good habit to fall into. No, uh, but a horse is like a lollipop in one way. All right, I give up. You tell me, what is it? The more you lick them, the faster they go. <laughs> oh, yes. That is a cute riddle. Of course, if you lick a horse, he'll go faster. And if you lick a lollipop, it'll go faster down your stomach. It's a very good riddle. Yes, thank you. Now, will you read me the funnies? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. <laughs> Hoppy had been captured by Calico and her henchmen and been put to work in the mines. By a daring trick, Hoppy succeeded in escaping from the mines and freeing many of the other prisoners that Calico had made slave laborers also. Meanwhile, back at the Stebbins Ranch, a meeting of the citizens is being held to do something about stopping Calico and her gang. One gent is speaking. We're here for a showdown, Sagebrush. We're tired of watching our homes and businesses being stampeded or ruined by a mob we can't lick. And another rancher speaks up. Yeah, they're too strong for us. We aim to sell out and quit the country. At this moment, the man named Spades Russ exclaims, Now, wait, wait, wait. Maybe hop along Cassidy can help us. <laughs> well, where is Cassidy? And why isn't he here now? Suddenly, the door opens. First picture, next row, and Hoppy steps in, saying, I am here. And he goes on to tell him, I just escaped from the old pyrite diggings. A crew of slave wakers who are being forced to counterfeit gold coins will soon be coming home. Hey, that must be where some of our missing neighbors disappeared, too. Hoppy goes on, last picture, second row. Well, it's no secret who rules Sulphur City. You all know Calico has been hiring killers and wanted renegades to help her build her lawless empire. Well, the time has come to strike back. We'll need every man in this room to march on Sulphur City, armed to the teeth. Why are we the Cassidy? Second picture, bottom row. Outside the barn where the meeting is taking place, one of Calico's henchmen who has trailed Hoppy is spying. As soon as he hears what's going on, he runs for his horse, last picture, saying, oh, I gotta warn Calico. There's enough of us to stop that bunch before they get started. That man was spying on them. Yes, it was, because now it'll spoil Hoppy's chance to slip up on Calico and her henchmen and catch him by surprise. Yes, but now there'll be a big battle, won't there? I'm afraid there'll be plenty of gunslinging. Oh, I hope that Hoppy wins. Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now let's turn over the page. Oh, there on page three is Prince Valiant. So here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Breckett, Gray Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Prince Valiant's trip to Rome has been held up because he stopped at the castle of Sir Refouk, and the castle was attacked by Black Robert. But Val has succeeded in convincing the two warring chieftains to end their dispute peacefully. And now Val and his friends mount their horses and ride from the battered castle into the misty night. It is better thus. They are eager to be on their way. And besides, they stopped this war before there was any chance of plunder on the part of the soldiers. Therefore, they're rather unpopular. So they decide to leave before getting into any unpleasant fracas. 
After a few days, they come, last picture, top row, to the old city of Lyon, crossroad of Europe, a sought-for prize by the barbarian hordes swarming across the Rhine from faraway Baltic lands. First picture, next row. As they pass through the streets, they see Roman soldiers, tired and dirty, playing games of dice in the street. Lyon is now an outpost of the dwindling empire, and the Northmen, Saxons, Goths, and Slavs are pressing close on the Roman heels. The barbarians are laying waste to the country as they sweep through, burning, killing, fighting like wild animals, seeking to conquer the entire world. Val and his friends stay there only long enough to have their apparel, both steel and clothes, mended. Then they load their horses and provisions into a boat. And, in the large picture in the second row, cross the River Rhone and see in the distance the snow-capped Alps Mountains rising in terrible majesty. First picture, bottom row, once more on the road. They travel the old Roman roads, which were built when Rome was in the height of her power. They advance swiftly, but everywhere they see signs of the decay of the law. Houses burned, people killed, homes destroyed by the barbarian soldiers who have passed this way. Val and his friends pass through a burning village, are sickened by the evidence of senseless brutality. Then, topping a hill, see the cause below them. An army of barbarians is slowly wending its destructive way across the land, and the rear guard has discovered them. And there, last picture, is a huge army of ugly, cruel, ferocious-looking soldiers who look almost half man and half ape. They stare wildly at Val and his few companions. Ooh, aren't those cruel-looking men? Yes. So many of them. Looks like it's almost a thousand to four. Yes. Val and his companions really are in a tough spot. And the enemy is right on the road that Val has to take if he's going to continue his journey. I wonder what happens now. Well, next week should tell us that. And right now I can tell you, if you'll pick up the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly, that I'll read to oh, you... Oh, I know. Dagwood and Blondie. And I have them right here. Very well. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Rama food, Emma fum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Alexander has been a bad boy, and Dagwood is saying to him, first picture, Young man, for punishment, you don't go to the dance tonight. Go to your room. Alexander says plaintively, But, Pop, what about Emily? I promised to take her. And Blondie adds, Her mother even bought her a new dress for the dance. Alexander goes on, last picture, top row, It's Emily's first dance, Pop. She'll be broken hearted. Dagwood roars, Okay! I'll take her to the dance myself. And Alexander says, first picture, next row. You'll have to call for and meet her father. And Blondie had... You'll have to jitterbug with her all evening. But Dagwood folds his arms and looks very firm. So Alexander tells him, next picture. You'll have to buy her a double marshmallow nut sundae after the dance. Dagwood unfolds his arm and points to the stairs, saying, Go to your room. I'm taking Emily to the dance. And as Alexander goes up the stairs unhappily, Dagwood stands, last picture of the row, one leg out, his arms folded across his chest like a Roman general chasing the barbarians. And Dagwood says, I've got to be firm about this. Blondie tells him, You'd better sit down a minute and think it over. And she goes out of the room. Dagwood sits down and begins to think it over. First picture, next row. He thinks and thinks and thinks. And Dagwood sees himself calling for Emily at her house. He imagines Emily's father shaking his finger in his face and roaring, She's got to be home by 9.30. Understand? And he thinks. And thinks. And thinks. And he sees himself at a dance. Dancing with Emily, who is wearing him out. <laughs> and Emily is saying, Faster, Mr. Bobstead! <laughs> And Dagwood is about to collapse. <laughs> and he thinks. And thinks. And thinks. And last picture of the row sees himself at the drugstore having to eat a double marshmallow nut sundae. And the thought of it almost makes him sick. And he thinks. 
and thinks and thinks. And he sees himself first picture bottom row, bringing Emily home. And her father meets him at the door with a baseball bat, grabs him by the nose and roars, You brought her home five minutes late! Then he hits Dagwood on the head. And Dagwood leaps out of his chair, dashes upstairs, and drops on his knee outside of Alexander's room and says, Alexander, I forgive you. I beg you to get dressed and take Emily to the dance. The door opens, and Alexander comes out of his room dressed for the dance, saying, I'm all dressed and ready to go, Pop. I thought you'd see it my way. <laughs> and down the stairs he goes, last picture, leaving Dagwood looking very relieved. <laughs> Wasn't that funny how firm he was going to be? And then he became afraid and he let Alexander go anyway. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, should we read Roy Rogers now? Oh, yes, please. Quick, read Roy Rogers, because this is awfully exciting. I should say so. Knuckles Hardy, Nitro Kane, and Furhead Fenton had put the explosive in the cave, and it was all ready to go off. And just then, Roy Rogers and Knuckles Hardy's son, his name is Tommy, they came after him, and they, they came right down in front of the cave where the explosive is. And then Tommy slipped and hurt his leg. At this moment, Knuckles Hardy saw his son was there. So read quick. Let's see whether Knuckles Hardy does something to save Tommy. And Roy, too. Very well. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip hi -yo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip hi -yo. <laughs> Knuckles Hardy sees Roy and Tommy directly in front of the cave where the explosive is set to go off, and Hardy yells, Tommy, get off that ledge! Dynamite in the cave! Ready to go off! As Tommy tries to get up, he suddenly exclaims, Oh, ouch, it's my leg, Roy! I twisted it when I fell! Roy exclaims, well, This place is gonna blow sky high any second. There's no time to carry you to safety, Toppy. So Roy dashes into the cave, first picture next row, saying, I gotta try to stop the dynamite from blowing! <laughs> At this moment, Furhead Fenton and Nitro Kane, a short distance away, run off as Furhead says, Hey, Knuckles Hardy is climbing up to the ledge. <laughs> Just then, Roy, inside the cave, finds the explosive seconds before it's to go off. Quickly, he jerks the wires off the fuse box and exclaims, Ah, yeah, that should do it. And just in time, too. And then he goes out of the cave. Last picture of the row, he sees Knuckles Hardy holding Tommy in his arms. And Tommy, who didn't know it was his dad that he and Roy were trailing, is saying, Hey, Dad! How'd you get here? And Knuckles Hardy replies, Never mind that, son. We've got to get out of here fast. Roy tells him, All right, ease up, Mr. Hardy. There's no rush. There's not going to be any explosion. First picture, bottom row, Tommy introduces Hardy and Roy. Oh, this is Roy Rogers, Dad. He saved us. And Hardy says, Everything was my fault, son. I wanted the river bank blown out to divert water to our ranch. And I've learned my lesson. And then carrying Tommy in his arms... He and Roy walked toward the horses. Hardy says thoughtfully, From now on, Tommy, you ride herd and your old man and keep him out of mischief. And then as they mount their horses, Hardy asks, uh, How about staying a spell at the box seats with us, Rogers? Roy replies, Some other time, Mr. Hardy. If I can make Saddle Butte tonight, it'll only be a day's ride from home. certainly was. And Mr. Hardy learned a good lesson, too, when he almost killed his own son. I should say so. From now on, he'll be a good and better man. I hope so. Well, now should we see what Uncle Remus has to say? Oh, yes, please. Very well, then. Turn over the page, and there on page three of the second section is Uncle Remus and his tales of Briar Rabbit. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. <laughs> Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on page three of the second section, Uncle Remus and his tales of Brer Rabbit. Magic words for the music, please. Say them with me, please. Hippity hoppity, hoppity make, make it, it a habit, habit to give us music for Brer old Brer Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says. One time, old Brer Fox was wanted by the law for counterfeiting. So he wrapped himself inside a barricade and told him to come and get him. 
Yes, Burr Fox has built himself a little bit of a fort on the top of a little bit of a hill. And he has three little cannons and a lot of other weapons to defend himself with. And all the critters are trying to get at him. But every time someone starts up the hill, Brer Fox shoots off the cannon. And everybody skitters back to safety behind the bushes. Finally, Burr Sheriff hollers, If you don't give up, Brer Fox, somebody is going to get hurt. Brer Fox waves a sharp scythe and hollers back, Yeah, and it won't be me. And as a few of the critters try to sneak up the hill again, Brer Fox fires his cannon again. Get back there, you critters, and stay back. And the critters skitter back to safety again. As the smoke clears off the field of battle, Brer Rabbit says grimly, "Uh Uh-oh, he means business. So he waves to all the critters who dash back into the forest to have a meeting. And as Brer Fox stands on a rock facing them all, they all stop talking. And it's a dramatic pause, and Brer Rabbit says, Now all you folks go home and get all the rotten eggs, tomatoes, and stuff you can find. And then you come on back and you hide till I give the signal. So the critters all skitter home to do what Brer Rabbit says. <laughs> Last picture top row, Brer Rabbit takes Brer Mole up to a waterfall, which is above Brer Fox's fort. And he tells Brer Mole he tunnel from there directly down underneath Brer Fox's fort. So Brer Mole sticks his nose to the ground and down he digs. In first picture bottom row, he's dug the tunnel right underneath Brer Fox's fort. Then Brer Mole slips through the tunnel back again to Brer Rabbit. And he says, Go ahead, Brer Rabbit. The road is clear. And Brer Rabbit then takes a hollow log, holds one end up underneath the waterfall, and he and Brer Mole point the other end into the tunnel that Brer Mole has made. And Brer Rabbit says, We stand aside, Brer Mole. Here comes the irrigation. And the water pours through the hollow log into the tunnel. And Brer Rabbit says, I expect Brer Fox is going to get his feet wet. And Brer Mole giggles. Yeah, and I bet he never saw rain come upside down before. And last picture, the water comes so forcefully through the tunnel that it blasts open a hole underneath Brer Fox, lifting him in the air and holding him there. And all the critters below throw their eggs and tomatoes at Brer Fox, who is held in the air. And as the rotten eggs hit him, Brer Fox hollers, Help! Stop! I give up! Do it! Hey! And Brer Rabbit, a sheriff answers, and not until us gets rid of all the ammunition, Brer Fox. And Uncle Remus said, Loud mouth is too full of bragging to talk sense. <laughs> oh, that Brer Rabbit. He sure is a clever one. He outfoxed Brer Fox again. He certainly did. It just goes to show that a powerful brain is more important than powerful guns sometimes. Yes. Well, now, shall we read Flash Gordon? Oh, yes, please. That's very exciting because Flash Gordon and Dale and Queen Suni were escaping from the wizards who had attacked the cave where they were. And just as the wizards were about to melt the cave and make the earth fall in on them, Flash and Prince Fino led everyone to the end of the cave where they found an underground river. And then they made rafts and they loaded their things on the rafts and they made their way down the river. And I want to see whether they escaped. Very well. Here we go on page four of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly with Flash Gordon. Rigga rigga doon doon, sashkamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> From their cave hideout, which has been attacked by Curzo's army, Flash and his companions drift along an underground river. As their raft rounds a bend, Flash shouts, I'm heading for shore! There's a waterfall ahead! But it's too late. The current is too swift, and it carries Flash and Dale last picture top row straight over the waterfall. In desperation, Flash and Dale cling to each other as they plunge helplessly toward the whirlpool below. First picture bottom row, the churning eddy chews their raft to bits. Dale calls to Flash to look behind him. And he turns to see the pool dragon, a blind creature of the underworld, hungrily reaching for them. Flash snatches a fragment of his raft and spears the river beast. There's a short, furious struggle, and the monster slips beneath the surface lifeless. But Flash and Dale are still not free from danger. Last picture, the racing current pins them against an underground grating, and Flash shouts, Hang on! Don't slip through! We'll drown or be dashed to pieces inside this tunnel! can climb up those gratings because they're just like bars across the window and they're sort of like a ladder and then maybe they can climb up and be saved. Well, I hope so. 
You know, I wonder what happened to Queen Strini and the rest. Next week, we'll find out about that. Oh, this is so exciting. Yes. And dangerous. Yes. Now I'll bet you're anxious to find out what's happening to Dick and Dick's adventures. Oh, yes. Well, then let's go to the very last page. And there at the top is Dick's adventures. I just love Dick's adventures because it tells all about the early days of America. I love to learn history that way. So do I. Dick is with General Washington and his army. It's the cold midwinter, and the soldiers haven't enough to eat, and their clothes are wearing out, and there isn't enough money to get them new ones, and many of them are quitting. Maybe General Washington can think of some way to make them stay. Well, let's read and find out. So here we go with Dick's adventures, and say the magic words with me. rickety pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick walks through the camp looking at the poor soldiers trying to keep warm around their campfires. Washington joins him, and Dick tells him, Some of the men think the war's lost, sir. They're starting to quit. Quitters? Why, this country wasn't made by... I mean, it isn't going to be made by quitters. Washington glances at Dick shrewdly and says, I've just received news, Dick. Bad news. It's about one of our men who refused to quit. And Washington tells Dick the story of this man who refused to quit. We see the story as it happened. Last picture, top row. Washington is helping the young man on with his coat. And he says, When British General Howe and his army were driving us out of New York, this soldier, a young school teacher who had been commissioned a captain, begged to be allowed to slip back into the city in order to supply us with vital enemy information. And we see the young man leaving on his mission, first picture, next row. I warned him of the fate that awaits all spies if caught. He nodded and left. And we moved on across New Jersey, leaving the British to capture New York. We procured the information. In trying to rejoin us, the enemy arrested him. They found all the documentary proof they needed to condemn him. Now it's the cruel fate of a spy to be hanged if captured. At last picture of the row, we see this young man being taken to the gallows by the enemy. He marched proudly. On the threshold of eternity, he turned to the enemy around him, and what he said, I hope, will be remembered for as long as our country lives. I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Last picture, we're back again with General Washington and Dick. And Dick cries, Oh, I know his name, sir. It's Nathan Hale. Everyone in America does remember. And once more, Washington glances at Dick shrewdly. Oh, I remember the story of Nathan Hale, too. He was a wonderful American. Yes, he was. It's such a sad, sad story. Yes, it is, but it was beautiful, too, because the spirit of Nathan Hale holds up an example to everyone, showing them the way to serve their country unselfishly. Yes, it does. But maybe when the rest of George Washington's soldiers hear about Nathan Hale, then they won't quit. Now, we'll find out about that next week. Oh, that's good. Oh, now look, underneath Dick's adventures, there was Rusty Riley. And I've been so worried about Rusty since last week because Captain Kloon and Squire Boggs were working with the smugglers and Rusty trailed them late at night. And he caught them in the middle of their crooked business. But then Squire Boggs discovered Rusty. Yes, and he locked Rusty below the deck of the old schooner that was there. But Rusty found an old rope outside the porthole and pulled himself up on deck so he could see what was going on. Oh, read quick, because I'm so worried. I want to find out what Rusty's doing. And I want to find out maybe they'll see him and do something mean to Rusty. Very well. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty pulls himself up to the top of the old schooner. He peeps over the top of the schooner hulk and sees Squire Boggs and Captain Clune at work. Rusty exclaims, Gee, Wilkins, Squire Boggs and Captain Clune are putting away a lot of metal cylinders, just like the one Tex and I pulled out of the water. And then he listens carefully, and he hears Squire Boggs say, Okay, Clune, that's the last one. Now, as soon as you get it out of sight, I've let the kid out so he won't get suspicious. On the 
the shore path, Tex and Mr. Kilgore are coming down the path where they think Rusty must have gone. Suddenly, they see Flip heading toward them. Tex says, Hey, wait a second, Mr. Kilgore. That's Rusty's dog. And he's all excited about something. Kilgore replies, Yeah, he sure is. Seems to be trying to tell us something. Last picture, top row, Tex says, By Jingo, that pooch wants us to follow him. Keeps barking and making short runs. Kilgore replies, Yes, I see. Wants us to follow him to give his warmth. So they follow Flip. First picture, bottom row. Rusty ducks down as he sees Squire Boggs and Captain Clue have finished with their work and are lifting off the hatch cover leading down below the deck where Squire Boggs had taken Rusty. As they lift off the cover, Boggs says, All right, Rusty, come on up. The hatch cover accidentally slid over the hatch. Come on up. Captain Plune says, hey, What's the matter with him? Why don't he come up? Squire Boggs waits a minute and then says, I don't like this, Clune. If he's hurt or anything, we're in real trouble. I'm going down there. Captain Clune replies, now Go ahead. I'll follow you. And the two men go down below deck. Rusty sees this. And then he slips forward very quietly and says, Oh, boy, they've both gone down there now. Hey, this is my chance. And he grabs the hatch cover and starts to push it across the top of the hatch, saying, Golly, this hatch cover is plenty heavy. No wonder I couldn't push it up from below. And then it drops on, last picture. And Rusty sits on the hatch cover, saying, There, now I got them right where they had me. And that hatch cover never slid on by accident. <laughs> Sure. Still, there are two of them. Well, maybe Tex and Mr. Kilgore will get there in time to help Rusty. Well, that's something else we'll find out next Good, week. Good, I'll be here. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right. Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.